Turn with me this morning in God's Word to Psalm 29. Let's read the psalm together. Psalm 29. Psalm 29, let's hear God's Word. Reading, of course, from the authorized version. Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thundereth. The Lord is upon many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaketh the cedars. Yea, the Lord breaketh the cedars of Lebanon. He maketh them also to skip like a calf. Lebanon and Siron like a young unicorn. The voice of the Lord divideth the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shaketh the wilderness. The Lord shaketh the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord maketh the hinds to calve and discovereth the forest. And in his temple doth every one speak of his glory. The Lord sitteth upon the flood. Yea, the Lord sitteth king forever. The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Amen. We know the Lord will stamp with his own approval and blessing this reading of the Holy Scriptures. Now my text this morning is taken from Psalm 29 and in the verse 2. It reads, give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. And my theme today is entitled, The Priority of the True Worshipper. Now, since moving into our new meeting house (coughs) on the 15th of June this year, we've been thinking about the subject of worshiping God. And remember that it's written, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And in light of this subject of worshiping God, so this is not just a subject for you who are visitors this morning, this is what we've been dealing with this past few weeks. We we thought, first of all, of the protocol of the true worshiper. And I thought about the text and the glass on the porch as you enter into the new meeting house. It was from Psalm 100 and verse 4. And it says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. And I ask you to consider the protocol of the true worshiper. We enter in because we've got a summons from God to repent and believe the gospel. We we enter in on the ground of the right sacrifice. It it must be in the ground of the shed blood because that's the only way we can approach God and meet with him. We enter in because we've got the right summons. We enter in, of course, because we've got the right spirit. And then last week, I, I preached on the subject of the praise of the true worshiper. And that's based on the second text, etched in the glass of the front entrance porch, Revelation 5 and 9, about singing a new song unto God, the the, the song of the soul set free, the the song of, of the redemption of the blood. Now today I want to move on. I want you to think of a third aspect of the subject of true worship. Not only the protocol of the true worshipper and the praise of the true worshipper, but I want you to think today of the priority of the true worshipper. As we come to worship God in the Lord's day in his house, what does God say to us? 
What does God's word say to us? Well, God's word says this. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. This text is also etched in the meet and greet porch as you come into this uh, worship area. And I want you to think this morning of three simple things. I want you to think of the meaning of worship. If you look at the text, it says, worship the Lord. So, so we'll pause there. What is worship? What does it mean? I want you to think of the overview of worship. What, what picture of any forms in our mind when we talk about the Sabbath morning being the worship service? What are we doing when we come to the worship service? Well, I want to put it very simply. I believe we are ascribing worth to God because worship is really worth Ship. It means that our hearts and minds are focused on God's person, God's power, God's provision. Someone has said that worship is the honor and adoration directed to the Lord. The Puritan Stephen Sharnock described it as an encounter with the living God. Now you think of that. You've come into God's house. It's the Lord's day. We've come in to worship. We're going to fill our minds with the worth of who and what he is. And as we approach him, we're having an encounter with the living God. So having the right protocol is not worship. Praise, as we said a few weeks ago, is not worship. While it's necessary and an integral part of worship, praise sort of sets the stage. It's the way in. We, we come before him with singing. We open our mouth with praise. But then the meeting takes place. The, the encounter with God. Worship is really a personal meeting with God. Now, ask yourself this morning, every time I come into the house of God, is that my experience? I come in to have a personal meeting with God. So when I could go out and anybody asked me what I was doing in the Lord's Day morning, I can say I was in the house of God and I met with my God. Let me illustrate. Suppose some of you invite me to your house So I've got the invite. You've given me the time and the place. And then when the time is ripe, I knock the door or ring the doorbell. And you open the door and then I go. And of course, there's hugs and there's greetings and there's handshakes and there's maybe the the peck in the cheek. And and, and of course, then there's the talk and the tea and we have fellowship and we we have an experience. We have a meeting with each other. Me getting the invite is not the meeting. Me standing at the door, ringing the doorbell, knocking the knocker, that's not the meeting. The meeting is when we greet each other. And we sit down to talk in a fellowship. So I want you to think this morning of the meaning of worship. Here's the overview. This is what it is. It's a personal meeting with God. And you think of this Lord's Day. One day set aside for praise and worship. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The Bible says, and what do we do? We come into his presence to ponder the worth of his person. We come into his presence to meet with him, who he is, and and what he's like, and what he's doing. And I want to suggest this morning that that's the real business of human beings. That is the highest activity that any human being can engage in. The worship of God. 
as the true and the living God. And to me, that's the real business of being a man or a woman or a young person. That's why God has designed us and placed us in the world. Well, we're different from the animals, you know. We, we are created in the image of God. To have a consciousness of God. Created so that we can have a, a relationship with God. Uh, that we can have fellowship with God. We're made to encounter and experience God. The way God has made us sets us apart from the rest of creation. We're different. So that, so that we could worship him. In the meaning of worship, I want you to think secondly about the object of worship. If you look at the text, it says, look at verse 2, worship the Lord. Now, now underline the word Lord. Do you see the word Lord in the authorized version? It's in capitals. Can you see that? Well, let me tell you that the word Lord in Psalm 29 is mentioned 18 times. And when you see the Lord in capital letters in the authorized version, that is the covenant name of God. The children of Israel would have talked about Jehovah. And their mind would have been filled with the sacredness of his name. Jehovah is the object of our worship. Now, we're not just to trust Jehovah, and that's important. We could encourage you this morning, have we already done that, to, to put your trust in the Lord. We're not just to love God, as the Bible says, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. We're not just to serve him, but we are to worship him. Did you ever think what comes first, whether it's worship or service? I believe the answer is worship. In our hearts and minds, we ascribe honor and adoration to God because effective service has to be rooted in the worship of God. Service follows worship. Service is not right if our hearts are not in a right relationship with God. Remember the Lord Jesus in Matthew 4 and verse 10. He's been tempted by the devil. <coughs> it's his third temptation. The devil shows Christ all the kingdoms of the world, the glory of them. He says, all these will I give you if you fall down and worship me. And what did the Lord Jesus say? Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thy serve. Note the order. Worship comes first before service. You see, the true worship of God will produce a heart and mind with the desire to properly serve him. Remember what the catechism teaches us about God. God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. It's, it's filling our mind with, with who God is and what he's like. This God of wrath, this God of holiness, this God of truth, this God of power, this God of love and grace and mercy. And you see, once that revelation grips our hearts and minds, what's our response? Once we're affected by that, our response will be like Saul of Tarsus. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Worship the Lord is a command. It's not obligate. It's not optional. It's obligatory. It's a command for all men. For all time. It's a universal command. And this word worship means to, to bow down. It means to, to, to bow the knee. There, there's a physical element here. There, there's a, a recognition that he's a superior and higher being. It, it's it's a, a mindset of showing respect. You think of a, 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 a king and you think of one of his subjects in ancient times coming in. He just didn't walk in with the hands in the pockets, chewing a bit of gum and, hello, your majesty, it's me. No, 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 he came in, bowing. 
He came in screaming. He came in to kneel at the front and to cry out to the king for mercy or whatever other provision he, he, he wanted. And, and you see, when we think about worship, we, 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 we should think not just of the physical element, but what do you think of the spiritual element in our hearts and minds? Worship the Lord. Why? Because no one else is worthy to be worshipped. Peter refused to be worshipped in the house of Cornelius. He told them to stand up that he too was just a man. The, the angels are not worshipped. The Lord Jesus, of course, allowed people to worship him, didn't he? To fall down at his feet and to kiss them. To, to bow down before him, to cry out, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Worship the Lord. Not Allah, because Allah is a false God. Not, not Baal. And of course, the people in the days of the children of Israel were to worship Baal. Baal was the Lord of the storms. And, and Psalm 29 is all, all about that Jehovah is the controller of the storms. Not Buddha. Not Ashtaroth. No, the true and the living God as revealed in the scriptures. The God who subsists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I want you to think also in the meaning of worship, not only the overview and not only the object, but, but think of the outcome. The outcome of worship. When do we do this? Well, well, we do it on the Lord's day. But we also do it regularly in our hearts and minds outside the formal worship setting. Because in our minds, we're continually and regularly ascribing worth to God. We're, we're thinking of the fact that he is of intrinsic value. That, that there's none like him. That he's unique. You think of this command, give unto the Lord the glory Due unto his name. That, that literally means to, to honor him. Ascribing value and importance to him. Making sure that he's the first place. Giving him due reverence and due regard. And this is a conscious, deliberate act by the grace of God. You, you're making the Lord the number one priority. Is that true of you this morning? Has your heart been brought to a place of brokenness where you cried out, God, be merciful to me, the sinner? Where, 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 you, where you've asked God in the ground of the blood to forgive your sin and bring you into a right relationship with him and your heart and mind is continually focused on thinking of him? See, I stress that because modern man no longer really worships God. The worship of God is a missing lost art today. Is any wonder mankind lives the way that he does? Thousands have left God completely out of the picture, even though they were built and made for God. Is any wonder we have problems in society, morally and educationally and mentally and, and physically? You see, there's a spiritual vacuum in your life that only the true and living God can fill because you were built and made for God. And without God, it's like a, a missing piece of the jigsaw. The, the picture's incomplete. William Gladstone, who was the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, I think 1868 to 1994, he, he was one day in Christ Church College in um, Oxford. And he was talking about the changes that had taken place in England in those days. And someone asked him, have you no anxieties then, Mr. Gladstone, for the future? And he said this, yes, there's one thing that frightens me. And it's this, the fear that God seems to be dying out in the minds of men. The fear that God seems to be dying out in the minds of men. Isn't that even more true today than it was then? People have lost the knowledge of who God is. And because of this, they've lost the reverence for God. And they no longer worship him.
That's the meaning of true worship. I want you to think secondly and very quickly. The manual for true worship. What is the manual for true worship? I'll answer it in one phrase. The scriptures of truth. Worship has to be according to the word of God. As God has revealed himself in the Holy Scriptures. If if you notice the, 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 the text goes on to say. Worship the Lord in what? The beauty of holiness. Do you know that those words beauty of holiness. Are mentioned four times in the Holy Scriptures. First Chronicles 16 and 29. This very text of scripture is quoted. This is what it says. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering. And come before him, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. It's found again in Second Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 21. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord that they should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army and to say, praise the Lord for his mercy endureth forever. It's found here in our text, Psalm 29 verse 2. It's found again in Psalm 696 in verse 9 and I'll just read the reference worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness fear before him all the earth for remember in the Bible in biblical numerics is the number of completion and here's the manual for worship here's the way Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Do not approach God or consider meeting with God without considering the fact that he is holy. And you as a sinner here this morning, if you're without Christ, you can't approach God and meet with him in your sin. You've got to recognize your sinful state and your sin needs to be dealt with. Your sin needs to be brought under the blood because you're without God and without Christ and without hope. And you can be joined to God on the ground of the blood. And if you're joined to God in the ground of the blood, then then you're brought into a, a wonderful relationship with God. And what do you discover? You discover that God is holy. You discover that God is intrinsically righteous. As we think of the words, the beauty of holiness... Let's remember we we come to God in Christ's name. We discover that Christ himself has a holiness and a righteousness that we need in order to meet with God. And it's in that we're clothed. We don't approach God in our own merit. We come with our hearts and mind filled with devotion and allegiance to him. But we come with a hatred for sin, hating the very lust of the flesh. We come with a desire to be different and separate from the world. We, we, we come with a willingness to forsake all that is unholy and impure. We come putting to death the works of the flesh. We come humbly. We, we come seeking God's forgiveness. We come seeking God's help and grace and power. <coughs> the Bible tells us holiness becometh thine house. Isn't there so much of a carnal, carnival atmosphere today in the house of God? That people come to worship God any old way. As if he's anybody. I want to tell you, God is holy. And when we come into his house, we're to remember holiness becometh thy house. He says, be ye holy, for I am holy. We're to come with reverence. We're to come with awe. We're to come with fear. In the context here, Psalm 29 has to do with Jehovah is in control of the thunderstorms. You think of a thunderstorm for a moment. It's not a frivolous thing, is it? It's not something that's lighthearted. It's not something that's jovial. It's something that gets your attention. It's something that produces awe and wonder. Surely the thunderstorm shows the the glory of God as our creator and maker. It it shows the wonder of his power. Doesn't the Bible say the heavens declare the glory of God and the earth showeth forth his handiwork? 
And of course, a thunderstorm is not something that's trivial or, or jovial or lighthearted. And as we come to God, we, we certainly don't come with our own inventions. We come realizing this is a serious thing to be in the presence of God. And I want to tell you this morning, we don't come barking like a dog. We don't come laughing like a hyena. We don't come rolling around the floor. I'm not saying we'd be morbid or sullen, but we come with a reverential awe. We come with a holy fear because we're coming to meet God. And we remember to worship him in the beauty of his holiness. And we come, yes, with a willingness to put away sin and our hearts being opened. Someone has said that the reference to the beauty of holiness has to do with the holy garments that the priests would have worn, the Levitical priesthood in the days of the tabernacle and temple worship. And of course, the Levitical priesthood had a particular clothing that they must wear to represent the Lord. It was a attire that, that, that God had set down. And I'm convinced that that's where the Sunday best actually comes from. This is the Lord's house. Holiness becometh thine house. It's the Lord's day. It's one day in seven set aside for a special activity. The worship of God going to meet with him. And therefore, people come dressed in their Sunday best. Did you know that a lady in Wales called Mary Jones, who saved up a long time and walked, I think, 18 miles barefoot to buy a Bible, did you know that when she walked barefoot, she had the, her shoes around her neck? Why did she not wear her shoes? Because they were her Sunday best. She didn't want to wear them out. And she would rather have walked barefoot than to wear out her shoes so that the shoes were clean and presentable when she came into the house of God. Now, if you've only one item of clothing, I know of a man who came to church in a boiler set, I have no problem with that because he only had the one item of clothing. But I want to say this morning, you wouldn't meet the queen in a T-shirt or a pair of shorts. No, you would wear modest and appropriate clothing because the clothing that you choose is, is, is a revelation of who you are and your demeanor as you come to approach God. We need to rediscover a high view of who God is. Not be lighthearted, not, not be half-hearted. To, to, to come with singing, to come with supplication, to, 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 to come with sacrifice, to, to, to come uh, 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 and, and listen to God's word. To, to come with meditation, to, to come with lifting up Christ, to come with a teachable spirit, to come reading the scriptures. I want you to think of one final thing, the motivation of worship. It says in our text, give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. You see, in this psalm, there's a creation theme. God speaks creation into existence by the word of his power. Notice the reference, the voice of the Lord. It's mentioned seven times. By his word, he spoke this world into existence. By his word, he sustains it. John 1 and 3. He made all things by the word of his power. Colossians 1 and 17. He upholds all things by the word of his power. Psalm 19 and 1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the earth showeth forth his handiwork. And we think of creation in the context here. He's the Lord of the storms. He's the God who's in control of the storms. We've been rejoicing in these sunny days and we're thanking the Lord that while it's been hot, we haven't been completely burnt up to a crisp or a cinder. The sun is exactly the correct distance from the earth and, and the earth from the sun. Otherwise, we'd either burn or freeze. See, God remembers not in nature. He's over nature. God controls the nature, the sunny days, the rain, the moon, the stars, gravity. And when you think about creation, you must think about your creator and maker. And you must remember you're dependent on him and accountable to him. And that's one of the motivations for worship. You're going to give glory unto the Lord. It's due to his name. Because there's a creation theme involved. There's also a redemption theme involved. Think again of the word Lord, Jehovah, 18 times, the God of the covenant. And if you're here this morning, you can also worship God with a redemption theme because you've recognized you're a sinner. 
Behold, I was shaped in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. I've got a soul and I need to be saved. Mark 8, 36. What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? You, you, you've discovered that, that I need Christ to save me. Acts 4 and 12. Neither is there salvation in any other for there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And we read the scriptures. We read wonderful testimonies. Did you know the first man, Adam, was the son of God? He was brought into a right relationship with God in the ground of the blood. The blood of the Lamb, just the same way we are. Think of Manasseh, a wicked king. How he was gloriously saved in the month of December. You think of Rahab the harlot. Saul of Tarsus, the chief of sinners. The Zacchaeus, a tax collector. The Philippian jailer. Lydia, the seller of purple. You see, they were all saved and they were all brought to realize that they could give glory unto the Lord not only because he's creator and maker but also because he's redeemer and as we we sing this morning we sing about the being of God and as we supplicate we remember we're, we're kneeling at the throne of God and as we read the scriptures we've got a word from God and if we think of sacrifice, we think about the giving of God and, and, and us giving on a portion willingly and voluntary back to him. And we think about the sermon. We're listening to God, the voice of God speaking to us. And that's important. So that we can have a view of his greatness, his goodness, his grace, his glory. And one final thing. There's a providential theme here. He's in control. The storms of life. Not only the storms in nature, but the storms right now. And maybe you're facing a storm. And why has he sent them? Well, storms can either draw us to him or drive us from him. There's a man called Jonathan Goforth who was a missionary to China. He was a blind man. And when he came back on furlough from China to America, he was in a particular meeting. He wasn't speaking to this other man. But this other man was just sitting watching him. And in that service, as John Goforth sat there, the man came to this conclusion. There's a man who knows and loves God. And that man in that meeting got right with God. And he was gloriously brought into a right relationship with the Lord. And then he went forth himself to serve the Lord. When we think about worshipping the Lord, it demands total obedience. With privilege comes responsibility. It demands listening to God. Intentively, God is speaking to me. It demands our consecration to God that's complete and wholehearted. It also demands godly reverence. And as we're overcome with creation, the theme that he's our creator, overcome with redemption, he's our redeemer, and overcome with providence. God is foreordained whatsoever comes to pass, and these things can draw us to him or drive us from him. And no matter what we experience, we can meet with him. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Thank you for listening this morning. Thank you for coming. And I pray God will bless these few thoughts to your heart today.